Hi everyone, welcome back to Growing Up in Scientology. Today's video is a live stream interview Q&A that I did with Marie Bilheimer in the Scientology and the Aftermath, I'm sorry, supporters of Leah Remini Scientology and the Aftermath Facebook group. Marie was featured in season two, episode two of Scientology and the Aftermath. Unfortunately, the Facebook live stream that we did was very laggy and glitchy. For this upload, I've removed all of the pauses and all of the technical malfunctions, so it won't be such a pain in the butt to listen to, but I have had to remove essentially half of the content. Marie and I will do this again in the future, and uh, we probably won't do it on Facebook Live. If you're not already in the supporters of Leah Remini Facebook group, you might want to check it out. We've been doing a bunch of live streams in there with the contributors of the show uh, to keep things interesting and educational in various ways uh, between now and whenever we get season three of Scientology and the Aftermath. If you have a particular contributor in mind that you would like to see a live stream or a Q&A with, go ahead and jump into the supporters of Leah Remini group and, and tag them in a post. Almost all of the contributors are the moderators of the group and uh, we're in there to answer your questions about our histories in Scientology and the Sea Org and what happened after leaving and what happened after participating in the show and all sorts of good stuff. One of the plug I should make before we get started is on March 10th, we are having a giant Scientology in the aftermath get together in downtown Clearwater. Everyone is welcome to join us. An open party, anyone can come. I'm gonna put a link to the Facebook event in the description below. And uh, if you wanna come, let us know. All right, I hope you guys enjoy. Here's my chat with Marie. This is awesome. I'm glad we're getting a chance to do this. Thank you for doing it with me. Sure. Why don't we just start out with what I've been asking the guys who are on the show, which is, is there anything that had to be cut from your episode that you wish had not been, that you'd, you thought you were going to get a chance to say, but didn't get a chance to say? Not really. The only, the stuff that was cut was kind of off topic. Um, and with me and my family, there's so many other facets to our history and what we've gone through. Um, but I was specifically trying to keep it to Aaron's story and what had happened between him and I and, and what had gone on um, with the treatment that we had experienced. Right. That's right. You, you didn't, you guys didn't even talk about growing up in Scientology or anything like that, did you? No, and not I, the disconnection from my mom and, and the reason I got declared and all of that had nothing to do with Aaron. That was way later, but the original start of me leaving Scientology was what I had experienced with Aaron. Okay. How did things change for you or did anything change for you after the show? Harassment-wise, disconnection-wise, anything like that? Nothing disconnection-wise because everyone was already gone, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, I had been declared already for a year and a half um, or about that. Um, and so the only other change was just new connections with other people on the show, um, other people that are out that I wasn't aware of. Um, and then just the general support from all of the fans reaching out, all of that. Right. I think people are always very interested to know whether, you know, OSA spies are automatically deployed on everyone or are your phones <laughs> being tapped or are, <laughs> you know, are you being infiltrated? Nothing uh, like that going on. I had a little bit of paranoia about that, but I don't think anything actually happened. I don't think they have enough people to... Um, support how many OSA spies and, and you know, private agents they'd need running around keeping track of all of us, so. Right. Exactly. It's, it's one of the things I tell people because, um, you know, we're having, like, these events in Clearwater, right? Like, these Scientology in, in the Aftermath, like, contributor get-together events. And you'd be surprised how many non-Scientologists are afraid that if they show up to this thing, they're going to start getting harassed and followed and, you know, phone calls to their office and everything. Yeah. And it's funny because on the one hand, I want to tell them, like, you have nothing to worry about. They don't have the time, the, the resources to, to harass everyone. Right. But then, someone, but then someone could also say, what do you mean they have billions of dollars? They could harass everyone. And I go, yeah, but they don't. But they're like, not that well live, organized either. Right. I mean, I live five minutes from Flag. Mike lives 20 minutes from flag. Maybe we just have cameras pointed at our house so they don't need to have PIs on us or something. But 
my life has not changed in any way after the show on a on a harassment level you know what right I mean? yeah what, what about people reaching out to you who are under the radar or still in Scientology and maybe like what kind of stuff happened there uh, without naming names obviously but um I mean I've definitely had people that I've known previously reach out to me um that are still under the radar and just they've you know said that they support me and all of that um but all of them are still under the radar um and I've had a couple of other people that I wasn't ever in contact with that I didn't even know in the Sea Org, um, even at like Bridge where I could have met them maybe, um, but that are now out and under the radar and they were just looking for support and people to talk to because they don't have that support system. Right. So when people reach out to you and they're under the radar, what are they saying? Are they just like, hey, want you to know I'm in your corner even though I can't say it publicly, basically? Yeah, pretty much. And these are guys who have to pretend that they're still in the fold because otherwise their families will disconnect from them, right? Yeah, and I've had some of them say, um, you know, I'm sorry that I haven't spoken up and I'm sorry that I haven't done anything. And, you know, um, I'm sorry I've been even a bad friend in some cases. Um, but still, I understand why they can't. Does it bother you at all when – that they're like in this little protected bubble. <laughs> My personal opinion is everyone should rip the bandaid off and eventually it's going to come to a head. So you might as well just do it now and not go through the endless tor turmoil of it. Cause no matter what, they're going to continue to harass you and someone at the church is going to be constantly bringing it up with whoever is in to try to get them to handle it. Yeah, I mean, I wish everyone was as fortunate as, as Leah and her family was in the sense that they managed to all leave together. Yeah. And I think it really was just fortunate. I don't, I don't even think you could chalk it up to, well, Leah is the famous one in the family, so of course everyone's going to do what she's going to do. I don't think that's the way it rolls. I think, no. I think there are plenty of famous people who, if they tried to leave, their families would disconnect from them. I think it was just a really fortunate thing. Yeah, and... You know, I personally know William, her, well, kind of brother-in-law, um, and have talked to Shannon and have talked to Vicky, and they all had their own reasons, too. So it wasn't, right. like, oh, we're only going to do it because of Liam, because she's famous, and that's not the, that's, that's not the family that they are. Were they already kind of halfway out the door anyway, and were like, uh, oh, I'm, I'm so glad you said something. We're the <laughs> We're yeah, out of here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm a little conflicted on the under the radar thing because I was under the radar for so long um, for the same reasons, like family, jobs, friends. So it's really hard. And, and, and I felt like I was actually doing a good service at that time because I was under the radar, but I was also helping Mike and Marty at that time um, understand things that were happening in the church that I was right. able to stay on top of so at least i was able to do something i wasn't just like thumbs up guys thumbs up <laughs> well and i was too you know i was like 10 years under the radar just allowing my mom to do what she wanted and even when it came down to her pressing us to handle it um we were telling her go do your scientology we don't care we, we haven't even been making it a problem we're not going to continue making it we're not going to make it a problem um and she wouldn't let it go. Um, and to me, it got to the point where I was already declared, I was disconnected, um, and I had lost all of my friends and tons of coworkers and the effect that it had on just my personal livelihood altogether. Um, I was sitting at home with like no one to talk to, and I'm like, I'm here alone, I'm being quiet, I'm still protecting the church by not saying anything why like they're still winning um and then i finally just decided okay i'm not i have to say something for the sake of other people so that it doesn't continue to happen to anybody else right what did you get declared for i don't know <laughs> seriously uh, i mean i didn't see it we had gone in for a comma because um my current husband had posted something on Facebook that he then later removed, and I refused to disconnect from my sibling who was declared 
uh, for posting about being transgender in the Sea Org. Um, and then my boss also got declared for various other reasons too long to go into. Um, but essentially, I, re I refuse to disconnect from my boss of 10 years and my sibling. Um, and didn't go in to do any of their recommended handlings. Um, so they declared me. God. So your boss was declared before you were, and you simply refused to leave your job. Yeah. Interesting. This is from Wendy Burks. Uh, the question is, did blow drills or knowing that someone blew ever seem out of place if Scientology was supposed to be the thing? Okay. So, um, yeah, and I was part of a few blow drills unfortunately it's, it's like ridiculous to even recall it but i ran through burbank airport looking for one of our staff that had left and we never recovered no way <laughs> how do you guys first become aware that the person is missing they just don't they don't return to um like a muster or you know and it's a couple times where they're like oh wait that person wasn't uh on you know, at their muster in the morning or they weren't at course in the afternoon or whatever it was, then they would eventually go maybe to their birthing and start looking for them. And then there'd be signs of like, oh, they must have taken some clothes or something like that. There's one question right now where it says, were you a cadet before joining the Sea Org? Um, no, I was not. I had actually a lot of friends that were cadets. Um, at one point, a few of them, I think maybe four of them had gotten authorization to private school. So we actually had a couple of Sea Org kids that were going to school with us, um, and they all ended up being some of my best friends. Um, and I would even go and do sleepovers at the Sea Org birthings, um, uh, and we'd pretend that I was one of the other girls that I kind of looked like in case any of the adults or uh, supervisors came around checking on us, um, but we never got caught. Uh, I wasn't supposed to be there, but I stayed there all the time. Um, and a funny thing to remember is that, or maybe not funny, but um, none of the adults, the parents of the people that I was staying with, they were most of the time never at the dorm. Like, even if I spent the night, I would never see the, the adults. Um, but uh, no, I was not in the cadet org. Uh, Marie, did you go clear? No. Um, when Aaron passed away, I was in the middle of the Ned rundown, and I thought I was about to go clear, <laughs> but now knowing what the clear cog is, I don't know if I would have gotten there, because um, it's too much of a mind fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll answer another question. It says, did you have to pay back your dues when you left? Um, so when I left, I was given a freeloader's debt of $150,000, um, and I was a little bit um, confused by that because Aaron's mother, my f previous mother-in-law, um, and my sibling at the time, who also left at that time, both didn't get freeloader's debts, and me being the spouse, I felt... Um, that was a little bit unjustified. Um, so I actually had written to senior CS Int, um, who I had worked with in the past. And I, I said, I really don't think I should have a feelers debt. I don't think I should have to do amends. I don't think I left on the regular terms. Um, and he wrote me back saying, wow, I never even heard of any of this. And I assumed that with the circumstances of Aaron's death, that he would have known something about it. Um, and he basically told me to go meet with um, senior INR, and I think it was Al, that dude Al, I can't remember. Um, and so I met up with him and he asked me, um, what do you want to do? What do you think is right? And I said, I don't want to pay my free letter set, and I don't want to do lower conditions, and I don't think that I should have to do any of the um, actions on the free letters uh, bill. And he said, okay, you're free and clear. So I walked away, and I never paid it.
and um, <laughs> I fought not to, but I didn't. So that's interesting because if you would have said, "Oh, I think I should only have to pay two thousand," they would have been like, "Okay, we'll take you two thousand." Like if they weren't even coming to you and telling you what was right. They're like, "Oh, what do you want?" Yeah. Well, and I eventually did get a statement back because they were sending me bills, and then I eventually did get a statement back saying zero dollars and I left it at my mom's so I never got to keep it um and I wish I had that as proof like hey look they wiped my hundred and fifty thousand dollar debt but yeah 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 I heard they have been drastically reducing the debts of people that leave the Sea Org these days like stripping it of almost everything like uh, you know Jamie Butterworth um yeah kind of Maggie Butterworth's son, Maggie's, Maggie had been in this year, David Butterworth's son. Mm. I mean, he did up to class seven auditor training and OT three and whatever. He paid like $5,000 when he left. I, I did nothing at, on, on the bridge and pay 40 just a couple years earlier. Wow. So are your parents still in Scientology? Yeah. Well, my mom and my stepdad. And did they ever have to have, like, the official disconnection conversation? Like, they write you a letter? No. My stepdad disconnected earlier than my mom, but kind of via my current husband, who called him pissed because my mom had said she might disconnect from me. Um, and then my stepdad told him, we're leading different paths. Have a good life. Bye. Um, and he never even talked to me again. So he didn't officially disconnect from me. Um, my mom did over the phone, um, less than two weeks before my daughter's first birthday, um, and her only grandchild at that time. Um, and both myself and my sister were pregnant with her second and third grandchild. Um, yeah. So, um, she just told me over the phone, like we were done. Did she, um, did she, like, call you from the ethics office? Did she make it clear, I have to do this? Or did she try to make it a personal thing? It was sort of like, we have different goals. We're leading different paths. And I'm making this choice. And I can't continue with the way that our relationship is. I'd never even told her anything negative until she started pressing me. And then once she knew my opinions, she couldn't look the other way and move past it. When my son was born, I spoke to her once more. My husband had called her and said, we need to fix this. And so four days after my son was born, she had called me. And it was really sad because I could hear the hope in her voice. And I thought she thought that I was ready to go into the org and do some sort of handling. And as soon as I told her, that's never happening she lost it again and it was like re-disconnecting all over and to hear like the wind go out of her sails and her realize oh my daughter isn't ready to handle it it was and four days postpartum um that was a little rough wow jesus you know, I, I think this is one of the things that people have the hardest time wrapping their heads around. And on the one on the one hand, the fact that she sounded hopeful is proof that she's not heartless. The wall comes down again. And you're like, what the fuck is that? I mean, we know what it is, but yeah. that's that's the thing that people just have so much trouble um Yeah. Wrapping their Well and me, I mean, of I was the youngest of four, um, and I was the most uh, dedicated, most Scientology trained um, of her four children. So when she would talk to me, it was also very much like she would still talk to me in Scientology like I was a Scientologist, like, you know the policies, you understand this. And I'm like, but that doesn't mean I agree with them. They're wrong. Um, and uh, I mean, I know that she loves us and wants to be with her grandchildren. And even in the, you know, video she did against me, she was very restrained and didn't go as 
far as maybe she could. Have. I mean, I'm not saying that I had a lot of shit she could have brought up, but it seemed like she <laughs> she was trying to somewhat protect me, which I had also done for her when we were filming. And so it was sort of one of those things where I'm like, is she just in hopes that if we do reconnect, like she wouldn't have done something too bad that I wouldn't be able to forgive her, that sort of thing? Because I'm almost even having trouble remembering your mom's video because I think it was so um, uh, blasé. That's a, yeah. It, it was I mean, so like, he wasn't really saying anything. <laughs> Aaron's mom's was was most of it. Oh, that's right. She made you responsible for what, oh, you weren't taking care of him. I was like, what is this woman saying? I know. This is ridiculous. I know. And that I'm I like, should look in the mirror. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. I remember watching that one. I'm like, it was hard to be outraged because it was so ridiculous. I was like, do you think that, do you think the church hands them a script? Or do they ask them to write up bullet points and they do the best they can? I think, oh my God, I, I actually have used that video to prove, like, look how crazy they are. Like, actually, people go to this website and see because it's so ridiculous. It's so awful. <laughs> it's funny. You know, some videos online get tons of views because people love them. And some people get, some videos get tons of views because people hate watching them. And I can just see the guys on the Scientology side, like, being so happy that their websites and videos are getting so many views and just like don't care at all that people are just hate watching them. Like no one gives a shit about their videos or their content or anything. <laughs> they're like, you you're have crazy. Wonder, you know, they're like, yes, our stats are up again today. They're like, you're trending for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> <laughs> oh, someone was asking what website. Um, it's the whatever, Leah Romini makes money aftermath website. I don't remember what it's called. <laughs> oh, after cash. Leah Romini after cash. Yeah. Some people have whole, like a web page dedicated to them. And then some people just have videos. Like I've actually searched for some person's videos and not been able to find them. It's not indexed very well. It, it's kind of weird. Um, yeah. I was surprised. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious if this was true for you. I was, it's one thing to be surprised about what the people on screen are saying about you. I was more surprised about who wasn't on screen saying things about me. Man, like, I was like, there was enough people there who I know genuinely disliked me. <laughs> oh. That I was like, where are those people? <laughs> See, I was goody two-shoes. I mean, I don't think, I was, but I was in CMO, so I had to kind of be a hard-ass bitch, but, um... But I was also an Esto, so I was, like, kind of caring for people, and I was, like, the mom of the org, and I wasn't, I don't, I wasn't that mean, I don't think. I got in cleared, so I'd done grade four, class four, gone through all of the in clearance sec checks, and approved through all of RTC, so I couldn't have been that bad. I mean, whatever, they put everybody at in, right, so, uh... <laughs> But, yeah, I was really curious. I was thinking, like, okay, who from the Sea Org would they pull out of wherever and, like, what are the random stories are they going to come up with? But it does make sense that they used my mom and Aaron's mom because those are the people that it would have hurt most and people that I specifically tried to protect by not saying something about. Right. So was he one of these guys who actually grew up in the Cadet Org for a time, or was he old enough when he joined that he just went into the Sea Org? No, he was in the Cadet Org, too, um, and then he was on the Red Shirt TTC. Okay. Yeah. Do you know how young he was when he got into the Cadet Org Sea Org? I don't. Um, sign us following. She might know. <laughs> <laughs> Being married in the Sea Org, you don't actually learn a lot of personal stuff. It's odd where I'm like, I feel bad that there's actually specific things about him that I don't know. Because we didn't have that time to, like, lay everything out and explain everything about our lives to each other that we'd had to that point. Yeah, it's true. I mean, so, like, how, how long were you guys going out in the Sea Org before you guys got married? <laughs> um, I think it was, like, let's see. He proposed to me in December, but we'd only gotten together in, like, um... October or November, maybe. And then we got married in June. 
but and that was long. Six months. That was. Why long. did it take so long? <laughs> I know, right? It was long for the Sea Org. <laughs> we were engaged for a long time, um, and then finally, and he was, but he was on an ethics mission, and so um, he wasn't allowed to do anything. And then finally, his his mission I see Jason Hortling at the time was getting so fed up with um, Aaron being frustrated that he wasn't married to me yet. So he just told us, go on your libs, or not on your libs, go on your CSP time, fly to Vegas, get married, come back, get it over with. And so that's what we did. We went, we flew out, we took a taxi to the airport, we flew to Vegas, my sister met us there, we got married, we flew back, and then we went to post in the afternoon. Aside from travel time, no real time off? Mm -mm. No. And then um, we got, we had like an actual wedding a couple months later. Right. All right. So you guys had a legit reason why it took six months. So like, I think Heather and I got engaged, what, two or three weeks after our first date. Now, a date in the Sea Org is walking around the block during exercise time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We would have gotten married, like, the next week or two. But you know how you're supposed to um, – she was in CMO, which is a senior organization. I work You know there. that it's a, it's a custom to write a request. So even though this request is supposed to be totally just ceremonial, it's not a real request, it was disapproved because I was in a lower org. And yeah. I don't know. I guess they're like, we don't know what's up with this guy. They made us do the – um, how to how to create a successful marriage course, which you can do in like an hour. Yeah. Like I had to ask more than once. Is it okay? Can we get married? Who is denying it? And then I, uh, the captain, the COCMO, Molly Hartley. Molly. Yeah. <laughs> <Bitch. sighs> and, oh well, um, Molly assigned all of the um, the groomsmen in our wedding because. Aaron had failed to ask the people that he wanted to be in the wedding because he was procrastinating. Um, and literally the day before she went through like the org and was, and said, okay, who's upset right now? Who's got, you know, in good ethics order and who's got like a tux or a suit they can throw on that Aaron would allow to be in the wedding. And she literally like did our lineup. That's crazy. Yeah. Hey, when I was in the Sea Org, I never knew Aaron personally. I knew of Aaron. I saw him at base briefings. And I always knew that this guy was always in trouble. <laughs> I don't know. I never knew why. Yeah. I just, the, the chatter about that guy was he's always in trouble and his wife's in CMO. And it was like, it was like, it's really weird. Yeah. His wife's at CMOIXU and he's always in ethics trouble. Like, I didn't even know Aaron. And that's what I knew about him. Yeah. Um, was it like that even when you guys got married? Like, did you get any pushback on like, yeah, you can't marry this guy? No, because when we got married, we were both at CMO Pack together. He was already class four and RB trained. And so he was in the Cracker Jack unit doing, you know, all of the ethics interviews for every investigation that CMO did. And he ended up, I moved up to CMOXU um, and then... I don't even know what the reasons were, but he ended up getting removed from CMO, or from CMO PAC and was posted at AOLA and was the examiner there for a while. Um, and then they transferred him to CC um, as an auditor. Um, and that's the last place that he was posted. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Did you, I remember on the show, you told the story of how you basically had to go right back to post and just lie to people for a long time after what happened with Aaron. Yeah. I saw a question here that asked essentially, did you have to get a sec check on it? Did you have to get do it like what you did to for this to happen? Yeah. So what happened initially is I went back to post, but I was struggling. I even passed out at muster one time. Um, and then they... The CS allowed me to go and stay with my sister off base, but I was coming back every day, every morning and going on, um, going in session and then um, just doing like the mess work and whatever. Um, and then eventually when I decided to leave, they took me off of the actual like 
auditing the processing on, you know, the net assist I was getting on the incident uh, and just switched it straight over to sec checking. Um, and so I was assuming, I'm like, okay, it's the leaving staff sec check. So you get sec checked on like your CORG history and anything you've done there. Mm. Mine was only Aaron. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you were getting your leaving sec check, did you get the impression they were really trying to dig in and make sure you didn't get away with anything? Or was it more like, we're going to make this as fast as possible? I th they kind of wanted to get me out of there. Because I was just like roaming the halls crying. And <laughs> and Not acceptable in the CR. <laughs> and they just wanted to like, yeah. You know, oh, that does remind me of something that I don't think was in the episode, which was that... Oh, I've covered in one of Tony's stories, which was that um, Aaron had passed away on, I think it was a Thursday, and then Saturday we'd have base briefing. And the port captain who was in charge of deciding which LRH lecture um, was played at that briefing, she knew of the circumstances and what had happened because she was in charge of taking care of the death certificate um, and all that sort of stuff. So she chose to play the marriage tape. And I was an executive still, and I sat in the front row of the entire base of however, however, however many hundreds of staff they had at that time. And I sat there going, why is this happening right now? What is, why would you do that? And I stood up and I walked away. I just walked out crying. Unfucking believable unbelievable did when you left i'm assuming you had nightmares about being back did they start right away or did it take a while mine have just been sporadic throughout the years for the whole time but mostly when i left i had dreams that aaron was still alive um and that he blew and that he faked his death somehow and that i found him that's a bit different um, well, I didn't leave because I wanted to leave the Sea Org. I, I was still there doing what I thought was right. Even when I left, I was, you know, I told them, I'm like, yeah, I'll go work, work for a wise company and I'm going to do anything that I can to, you know, continue to, you know, push the, the same purposes and stuff like that. And I thought like, oh, I have all of this knowledge under my belt and I can, you know, I'll be successful doing that and stuff like that, you know? <laughs> okay, so... I'm trying to recall if anyone else um, asked questions that I can answer. How long have you been out? Um, so I left the Sea Org in 2000 and, early 2005. And then I would say I was not a church member as of like 2012 maybe? I don't, I don't have an official year that I decided not to be a Scientologist. It just kind of happened slowly. Is the divorce rate high, someone asked in the Sea Org. Um, I would say yes. So someone had asked if we had gone to therapy or how we feel about that. Um, yes, I have gone to therapy and I'm still going to therapy. Unfortunately, I've had a lot of things going on in my life. So I haven't necessarily touched on everything to do with Aaron even to this point. And it's, it's still hard for me to uh, delve into that all. Oh, was going to therapy hard at first, considering the Scientology perspective on psych psychology? Uh, yes, the very first time I even called to make an appointment um, for therapy, it was it was hard to even have the conversation. Um, and but once I started, it was it was okay. And then someone else asked, "Is Karen Poole and Aaron's mom?" No, there are a couple of different Scientology Poole and families. Um, Aaron's parents were Brian Poulin and Sheila, now Fraunfelter. And then Claire, uh, Claire Headley asked, what helped you make the decision to speak out publicly? Honestly, watching the first episode of the first season is when I decided. I just felt <coughs> excuse me, that I was still protecting the Sea Org and Scientology by not speaking out, and I had no reason not to anymore since I'd lost everybody. Um, so that was the point when I decided I needed to do something about it.
And then this person, Vanessa, asked, were you already out when you watched the first episode? Yes, I was already out of the Sea Org, out of, the, out of Scientology, um, and had already been disconnected from. Um, what is your favorite episode of Aftermath? <laughs> Um, my favorite so far has been um, with Chantel's mom reconnecting with her. I kind of blubber cried. Yeah. How did you come to get on the show? I had already been kind of in touch with Mike Rinder previously. Um, I had I had emailed him through his blog, just kind of looking for help and advice. And then I had told him, like, I would be available if they plan on doing a season two. And then when they announced they were doing a season two, I messaged him again. I'm like, hey. <laughs> um, and he's like, yep, we haven't forgotten about you. But I think at that time, there weren't a lot of people personally coming forward. And especially with the types of stories that have now come out. I can say is that also from the first season, watching every single episode, knowing that to a degree, I had experienced those same things or those same treatments or knowing that whatever those circumstances were that that person was going through, that the way that they explained that it was dealt with was how it would have been dealt with. And so that proved to me that those stories were valid and they were true. And I knew hearing them from all of you that that they were accurate, you know? Um, and then the same with season two, every single one, it's something that you know, and you've, experience and, and felt those same things to a degree, regardless of the specifics of your story. We've all had that same treatment. Right. Had you met Mike, like not just attending an event, but had you met Mike through your post while on the Sea Org? <laughs> uh, one time. <laughs> so um, he had come down from Int at one point, And whenever the Int staff came down, I, I was used as part of the services team to run for them whatever they needed. Um, and I had kind of come through the conference room, just cleaning up, picking up trash and whatever. Um, and then he asked me for a tea. So I served him tea. <laughs> yeah. So even though you were in CMO at this time, was he in CMO Int, not OSA Int? Yeah, he was CMO Int. Was he CO CMO Int or WDC OSA? He was WDC OSA at that point. I'm sure everybody knew what we just said. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I felt, wasn't at one point, was he WDC OSA and CO OSA? Or that was the other dude. He was like, he was the CO, but he was WDC Yeah, no, he wasn't both. Was, who was the other guy? Kurt? Yeah. Wyland? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Someone asked, were you surprised by Nathan and Tara ranch episode? Yes. I actually knew at least one person that had gone to that same ranch. Um, he was actually in some of the photos that were on the episode. And that was, that was hard to see because I'd known that person and I didn't know what experiences he had had at the ranch. Um, he never talked about them and we were actually close at one point. But listening to the audio as well of the teacher who was abusing the children, I, I had to turn it off. Um, that was the only episode that I just literally broke down past the point of being able to continue watching. And especially... Being a parent now um, and having two young children and to think of all of the abuses that all of the Scientology children that I know or don't know, but like all of us went through these crazy abuses and why would you think it's okay to do that to your children or to give your children up to something that you don't fully know about? And so a lot of times the parents would just... You, you put your trust in something because it's Scientology and you're told like, oh, you put them in this school, they'll be taken care of. And you trust it no matter what as the parent because you're assuming that they're doing the things, you know, that are, that are right for your child, regardless of the parent actually looking into what they're doing. Or for whatever reason, the parent agreeing with some of that stuff because it's Scientology and, and accepting that that's okay. And it's not. Would you have left with Aaron if he told you he was going to blow? Okay, so would I have left with Aaron if he was going to leave? Maybe. It's a really hard question. Um, I felt like there were definitely times where I felt a pull to leave. Um, and I actually stopped myself from going on libs and spending time with my family because every time I saw them, I felt like I wanted to be with them. Um, and I'd start having doubts. And so 
I stopped myself from doing that because I felt like it was wrong for me to think like that. So if Aaron had been open with me, I might have left with him. Um, it's hard to say because it didn't happen. Has anyone told you today how wonderful and beautiful and well-spoken you are? <laughs> April. <laughs> Um, do either of you know of anyone who literally told Church of Scientology to go F themselves and refuse to get an abortion during that time where they were mandatory? I didn't know of anybody, um, refusing an abortion. It got to a point where if you did get pregnant, then they would tell you to leave. So they stopped. Oh, not even give you an option. Yeah. And I knew people that did that. I mean, I guess if you wanted an abortion, you could choose that for yourself, but it was like, people were oh, like, Oh, they would make you say you wanted to do it. That's what you're saying? I'm assuming that because I don't know anybody. I had already left by the time I had seen this happening where people I knew got pregnant and left. And then they told me, if you got pregnant, they made you leave. Right. Well, I know. guys, I, I hope at least you've been able to hear Marie without too much trouble. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. I don't really know what the problem is. But, and I'll also upload as clean of a version as possible to YouTube so that people can watch it without having um, the technical distractions. And, and hopefully Marie's audio is, is fine and, and it'll, it'll be cool. Thanks, everybody. We'll see <laughs> you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.